All right, welcome back. This is Dr. Schlosser for The Rise of Europe for Lee University, and this is the introduction for The Song of Roland. I just wanted to say a few things about this book and what went into the making of this story, because I think there's a lot of things that go into it that if you're just reading it um, and you don't have the knowledge outside of just the text itself, it makes it kind of tricky to know all of what's going on. So I just wanted to say a few words uh, to get us into this text. And to do that, first we need to talk about um, the the sort of poem that it is itself, the poetry of the text. This is a poem. It's an epic poem like Beowulf. Now, within the genre of epic poetry, there's a, there's a subgenre here that the Song of Roland fits into. And this is a type of epic poem that gets developed during the period that we're talking about now, the Central Middle Ages, roughly 1000 to 1300, called Chausson de Geste. And that's a, it, it's, it's a French phrase, and you can see here, it literally just means the Song of Deeds. So these are stories that were based on real events, real people, things that actually happened. But they're the, the stories of heroic people, heroic deeds, uh, the sort of ideals that a group of people would want to aspire to. So in this case, Roland is the Song of Roland is a French story. Um, Roland is held up as sort of the ideal French knight. This is what um, the the French people, those aristocrats, those those landed elites, those people who who trained all of their lives to fight those bellatores in that feudal system. Um, this is. Roland is held up as sort of the paragon or the ideal of what that knight, what a good knight is supposed to look like. So that's the genre of this poem. This is the Chausson de Geste. And uh, what we have for us here in, in our edition is a English translation from the Old French. Um, but some of the some of the poetry is preserved for us by our translator and editor, Dorothy Sayers, who did this in the 1950s. Uh, we should say that Sayers was a friend of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and some of these uh, medieval, uh, the, the scholars of medieval literature, medieval and Renaissance literature at Oxford uh, in the middle of the 20th century. And um, she hung out with, with those folks. Um, and she gives us our translation here. Um, so I, I just want to read this first section. This is what would look like for us um, a stanza, but in the in the French it's a laze, um, and and get a sense kind of of the of the poetry and and how that's preserved for us in this translation. So you can follow along. Carlon the king, our emperor Charlemagne, full seven years long, has been abroad in Spain. He's won the highlands as far as to the main. No castle more can stand before his face. City nor wall is left for him to break, save Saragossa in its high mountain place. Marcelon holds it, the king who hates God's name. Mahound he serves, and to Apollyon he prays. He'll not escape the ruin that awaits. So just want to pause a minute and, and let you... Uh, take that in. There's a lot going on in, in this one laze that I want to unpack. Um, but just sort of literarily, I want to look at it and, and think, uh, does this stanza or laze rhyme? And you look at it, you think about it, and a lot of students will say, well, uh, kind of, right? I mean, the, if you look at those first three lines, uh, it seems to rhyme. Charlemagne, Spain, Maine. There's a, there's a rhyming aspect to that. But then if you go go on there's other other ending words that don't quite fit right face and break and awaits so so they don't really rhyme but there is a there is a sort of linguistic connection here and and um it's this it's this term called and I'll I'll try to write it here for you um called assonance and assonance is um the repetition of a particular vowel sound. So it's not particularly rhyming, but each line in this laze ends with the same vowel sound. In this case, in laze one, 
that that vowel sound is the long a sound. So so you do get that in Spain and Maine and and those rhyming words, but then you also see it in the ones that don't rhyme, like face and break and so on and so forth. So um, Sayers has has preserved for us in in her translation that poetic device of of assonance that was in the old French. Um, and then there's another aspect of the poetry that she preserves. And um, again, some of this is linguistics, and I, I, I won't get into sort of the, the weeds of it, but you'll notice that sometimes the same character is referred to um, by different names. And so uh, in this case, if you look at that, that first line, Carlon and Charlemagne are... Um, are the same character. They're, they're two different names for the same person. And so uh, I, I want to uh, look at some of the characters, some of the important people that we need to, to be focused on. Um, but also notice that, that some of these characters have multi multiple names. So for, say, for example, Charlemagne, you'll also see Charles or Carlon, as we saw in that first line. Um, again, there's a, there's a poetic linguistic reason for that, that, that Sayers has maintained this. Uh, part of it is that Old French, like Latin and modern German, is an inflected language. Names can look differently in, in uh, different parts of a sentence, depending on um, the sort of uh, grammatical function they serve in that place. Um, and so that's one reason that these names might appear differently in different places. Um, but also, in terms of sort of the poetry of it... Um, I think Sayers will sometimes make these choices of using different versions of the name um, to maintain that um, assonant character of the, the poetry to to preserve um, whatever vowel sound is being used in that particular laissez. So those are some of the poetic features of the Song of Roland that I wanted to highlight. Let's just look quickly at some of these characters that um, I think it's important for us to be aware of. This is an epic poem, and like in a lot of epic poems, there are a lot of names that are thrown at us, and it's sometimes hard to keep track of everybody, and it doesn't help that um, some of these characters have um, are referred to by more than one name. That just complicates things even more. Um, so I just want to point out a, a few that I think are important for us to sort of highlight and remember and be paying attention to as we're reading this text. Um Charlemagne, obviously, we've we've already noticed um, he's he's the king, uh, the Frankish king and emperor. Uh, though not actually the main character of the story. The story is the song of Roland. Roland is the hero of our story. He's the main character. Um, uh, even when he's not uh, in the text, he is. Uh, if he were off stage, as it were. Uh, his presence is still felt kind of even when he's gone. So Roland is our main character, our hero, our protagonist. Um, and then often associated with Roland will be his companion Oliver. You'll notice that a lot of the a lot of the people in the, the this story in this poem are paired off. Um, and there's there's duos throughout the story and Oliver is the right hand man to Oliver. Uh, Roland. It's it's almost a Batman and Robin sort of dynamic. Um, and we can talk a little bit more uh, in class about uh, the different characters of, of Roland and Oliver, and they balance each other out in, in different ways. Uh, but they will often go together, and that's important to note. Turpin will just say a little bit about uh, he is an archbishop, he's a religious leader, He's the spiritual advisor to Charlemagne and the Franks, um, but it's also interesting to note that Turpin is out on the battlefield fighting, and I think that's kind of an interesting dynamic and an interesting character to uh, be aware of and, and to keep an eye on. And then lastly, Pinabel is uh, one of the vassals of Charlemagne. He's a Frank. He uh, is a defender of Charlemagne and a defender of Roland in a way. Um, the importance of Pinabel, the way that he really takes center stage in our story, comes towards the end of it. And, and as we get towards the end of the book, we'll come back to Pinabel. But he is someone that I want us to be aware of. On the other hand, we have our antagonist, or our bad guys, if you will. And here we can see there are uh, some more characters who have... Um, alternative names, and I wanted to point this out so that we don't get confused, or to try to minimize confusion. Um, 
the principal antagonist of the story is Ganelon. Um, Ganelon is Roland's stepfather. He is a vassal, a, a, a faithful, supposed to be a faithful man of Charlemagne. Uh, however, he does end up betraying Roland and betraying Charlemagne, um, and and is the sort of catalyst for the drama and uh, conflict in this story. He does this with the cooperation of the Muslim king in Spain. Marcelon, sometimes called Marsile, and so be aware that, that that's the same character. Um, when you see those two different versions of the name, it's talking about the same person. Um, and and uh, Marcelon is sort of the 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 main leader of the enemy army, uh, fighting the Franks most of the time throughout the story. And Marcelon's wife is Bromamon. She doesn't play an incredibly uh, large role in this story. But um, she is one of the more principal female characters in the story. And as such, I think it's interesting to see how uh, her role plays out and how she interacts with different people uh, and plot points along the way. And then finally, Balagant. Um, he is uh, another Muslim leader, but he is even more superior than Marcelon, the, the king in Spain. Balagant is an emperor and he travels all the way across the Mediterranean from um, from Baghdad. Uh, and uh, towards the end of the story, we have a, sort of an, uh, a, literally a, an epic showdown between the Christian Emperor Charlemagne and um, the Muslim Emperor Balagant. So those are some of the characters uh, that we will encounter. So let's talk a little bit then about how this poem was transmitted over time, how the story was transmitted over time, and along with that process, how it changed. All right, so the seeds of this story are, are rooted in things that actually happened, and, and I mentioned this when I was talking about the literary genre, right? The, the Chanson de Jest, the Song of Deeds, right? These are the, the heroic deeds, those deeds of the, the heroes of the past that were passed down. Um, through the generations. And so, obviously, we, we've we mentioned there was an, an actual person named Charlemagne. There was an actual person who served Charlemagne named Roland. Um, they fought in an actual battle uh, in, in Spain called the Battle of Roncevaux that the story is based around um, in the year 778. We know that that battle happened. Um, spoiler alert, Roland dies. Um, he actually did die in this battle. Uh, we have other sources to to back that up. Um, beyond this poem. So so we, there are aspects of this poem that actually happened. But that story was told and retold and told again uh, until it was finally written down. It wasn't written down until sometime around the year 1100. That's more than 300 years later. This is a long time. So things have changed since the actual events happened and, and when we get the, the written form that it is now. And you'll notice right around that same time that the poem is written down, the first crusade is called. And, and I would reference you to the to the video about the crusades um, that's also posted on this channel to, to get a little bit more of a sense of what that means and how that all worked. But for our purposes here, just be aware that, that crusading, those crusading ideas played into or, or are being played into the composition, the written composition of this poem. And, and that's important to understand, because as we compare what actually happened, what we historically know from our other sources, how this actual battle took place, um, to the way that it's presented in the text, there are some significant changes. And we need to be aware of um, what those changes are and, and how those may have taken place. Right? So there was an actual battle fought in Spain in 778, and... Charlemagne and his Franks are involved in that battle. It is an ambush. They're, they're surprised in the mountain pass as they're going back to, to modern-day France. Um, but in the battle that took place in 778, the, the one that actually happened, 
the group that ambushed them was a Christian group called the Bosques. And the Bosques are kind of a, a, a hard-to-get-at group. They don't quite fit into other ethnic and linguistic categories of, of other people groups in Europe. Um, there are still Bosque communities in northern Spain today. But importantly, these are not the people represented in the text, right? They're, they're Christians. Um, they're, they're not... Um, they're ethnically different than the people uh, presented in the text, um, but that's historically what what happened. Um, and as I mentioned, there actually was someone named Roland who dies in this battle. So, so as I said, there are seeds of historicity. There there are seeds of things that actually happened in the story. But the story that's presented to us some three hundred years later is not the stuff of facts, right? It's it's not a it's not a historical rendering. It's it's a it's the stuff of legends, right? There there are there are legendary aspects to this poem. For example, Charlemagne is some 200 years old in this text, right? He he seems to be immortal. He's living forever. He has this long flowing gray beard that is, seems to be unmatched in the world. Um there's all kinds of legendary aspects to this poem. And instead of those Christian Bosques that the Franks are fighting, the enemies become Muslims. And that's important because, as I mentioned, the First Crusade had just been recently called. And as there are official calls for warfare and violence and, and sort of divine sanction for this, it seems, um, the pitting of Christian Europeans against Muslim non-Europeans is a very distinct division that we see in this text. And and so, the way that Muslims are presented, number one, uh, is, is just as the outright enemy of the Franks and is of the European Christian people generally. Um, as, as I mentioned uh, towards the end of that poem, uh, we get sort of this epic battle between Charlemagne and, and the Muslim emperor from Baghdad, Balagant, um, it's it's almost a cosmic battle uh, between uh, Christian forces, the forces of good, and uh, the Muslim forces, um, the forces of bad in this in this text. But the presentation of Muslims in the Song of Roland is is complicated. It's um, it, it's it needs nuance. It, it needs some understanding. All right. So, um, writ large. Muslims in this text are presented as um, holy evil, holy wicked. Um, they are they are black and white in stark contrast to the to the Christian Franks who are who are the the heroes, the good guys. Um, so there's there's not a lot of nuance uh, to the character of the Muslims. Um, this has something to say about about chivalry, about knighthood, about feudalism. Um, and and that's something that we can talk about more together, uh, but it's something to to notice right off the bat. Additionally, the beliefs of um, the Muslims is not represented accurately um, according to what Muslims actually teach and believe. So um, I'm just going to take us back quickly to that passage. Um, and you'll notice Marcelon, the Spanish king, these last three lines of the, the stanza here, the laze, um, the Marcelon, the king who hates God's name, Mohound he serves and to Apollyon he prays. So notice who, um, Marcelon religiously serves, right? It's Mohand, or another name for Muhammad, and Apollo, the ancient Greek sun god, right? So if if you compare that to what um, Muslims actually teach and believe, right? Muslims are not polytheist, but they are monotheist, and the god they worship is called Allah. Uh, the, the a name for a deity that doesn't appear in the text, and, and then you'll also notice that uh, it's not just uh, Muhammad who Muslims don't worship, but is uh, revered as a prophet, and Apollo who is 
a classical Greek god, but also this other deity named Tervagant, uh, who is a, a sort of nebulous uh, third deity, presumably worshipped by Muslims in this text, um, that we don't really know a lot about um, otherwise. Um, that name doesn't appear really in any other sources. Um, there's not a lot of descriptions in the text to, to tell us anything about Tervagant. Uh, we don't we don't really know a lot about it other than grouped together here there seems to be a, a kind of um, unholy trinity in again in kind of black and white stark opposition to uh, Christianity um, and uh, so it's it's important to realize in this context of um, this early crusading period um, with the idea of um, Christians uh, as part of this reconquista, this idea of reclaiming Spain for Christians after the Muslims had come in in the 700s, um, that that Muslims here are presented in the Song of Roland in a in a crusading mentality, in a, in a attitude, in a rhetoric um, that is very much um, stark and black and white, and there's not a lot of middle ground for compromise or living together. Um, and so these are just some of the things that I think are important to realize and to be aware of as we read and discuss the Song of Roland. Um, I hope that this has made sense. I hope it has been helpful. And if you have questions, um, please feel free to respond to this video or to, uh, to send me any comments or questions that you have. Uh, thanks very much, and I'll see you next time.